Our gospel and first reading from Samuel are well-known events in the scriptures. There's uh, even a famous song that we'll hear in this Mass, Here I Am, Lord, based off of our first reading. And lots of ink has been spilled by preachers and scripture scholars on these two events, but allow me to spill a bit more and focus on the disposition of these men's hearts. Andrew and scholars assume John the Evangelist go to Jesus after John the Baptist reveals his identity as the Messiah. The disciples of John the Baptist knew that he, being John the Baptist, wasn't the Messiah, since he had said that regularly. But now they know who the Messiah is. They trust John the Baptist. And so as he points him out, they run. They don't walk, they run to Jesus. And when the Messiah asks them what they're looking for, they didn't know how to answer the question. They couldn't even call him Messiah or Christ. They blurt out rabbi. And then they ask him, where are you staying? Now that momentary exchange is where I feel we need to focus our attention this morning. Now you may find this hard to believe, but I'm actually pretty shy. I was worse as a kid. Once I got warmed up, I loved having an audience, don't get me wrong, but it still took some warming up. Uh, eventually in, in seminary, I had to take one of those personality tests that I'm an ENFJ, so whatever that thing's called, I had to take that. Um, and I'm, I am an extrovert, but I'm just barely over the line. On the, the range from introvert to extrovert, I'm I barely an extrovert. And in junior high, um, what used to be Mother Garen High School, which I lived not far from, which was an all-girls high school, they would allow uh, junior high students to audition for their spring musicals. And so being a lover of theater and a lover of having an audience, I did audition every year that I was allowed to. I think it started in sixth grade. But I was always really nervous uh, to be around all these high school kids who, in my sixth grade mind, were already adults, and I was worried uh, that they wouldn't accept me. A friend of mine, his name is Brandon, uh, was three years older than me, and we were in Boy Scouts together. We went to grammar school together. And he was already in high school auditioning for regular high school roles at, at Mother Garen, even though he himself went to Fenwick. But he kind of took me under his wing. When I was in sixth grade, he was a freshman. Uh, he already knew the others that were doing theater at Garen, and so he would introduce me to his friends, and he really helped me to feel welcome and at home. He warmed me up, as it will. My point here is that I really didn't know if Brandon had any friends. I was making that assumption. I didn't know if Brandon was accepted in the group. Again, he didn't go to high school there. I mean, there's, so there's Mother Garen for the girls. Next door was Holy Cross for the boys. He didn't go to either school, so I didn't know if he really knew anybody. I couldn't assume that he was even accepted himself. All I knew is that I trusted him, and I stayed at his side. And the disposition of my heart was one of complete trust and surrender that my friend Brandon would take care of me. Now, Andrew and John trusted that Jesus is the Messiah. They were waiting for this Messiah a long time, but they really, after meeting him, really didn't know what that meant. As Jesus kind of turned a lot of people's assumptions upside down, I'm sure, in the mind of Andrew and John, Jesus did not, was not the picture of a Messiah that they envisioned in their imaginations but they trusted he's the guy. And that trust put their hearts in a correct disposition. I don't know anything about you, Jesus, but I want to remain at your side to learn and see. 
Now Samuel, in our first reading, hears his name being called, he assumes it's Levi, uh, Eli, excuse me, he assumes it's Eli, and eventually Eli tells him it's the Lord. Samuel just trusts Eli enough, and he starts talking to the Lord. Samuel doesn't respond, you're crazy, like God's not talking to me in my sleep. He trusts, he doesn't ignore, he trusts and obeys. He trusts Eli. He remains at his side learning from him and does what he says. And because of that, Samuel enters into this beautiful conversation with the Lord. So what is the disposition of our hearts toward the Blessed Trinity? Do we trust the Trinity enough to remain at his side no matter what? Do we only trust the Trinity with trivial matters like help me win the Powerball, or help our team win the game, or please God, just 10 degrees warmer of weather. Do we trust the Trinity at all? Do we pray? How do we fix our hearts to be in that right disposition of total trust and surrender? The answer is daily prayer. My friends, if you're not praying every day, you will continue to find it more difficult to trust and surrender to the Blessed Trinity. If you're not praying every day, there is your New Year's resolution, or another one to add on. <laughs> Make it your daily priority to speak to the Lord in prayer. My friends, it's so easy to do, but it's also very easy to get distracted and allow the evil one to put all these roadblocks in our way that stop us from prayer. My best advice to you is to set aside and actually schedule in your calendar five to ten minutes a day, if you're not already praying every day, maybe start with the five minutes, just like going to the gym, start with achievable goals so you don't kind of let yourself down at the beginning. Um, so start with five minutes a day, and whether you're reading the scriptures for the upcoming Sunday or you're reading the mass readings for that day or you're just reading through the Gospel of Mark or whatever you're going to do, do that for those five minutes. But give the Lord every minute of those five or ten or twenty, whatever you're doing. For those of you that are praying every day, up it by five minutes. Give the Lord every second that you promised him because the evil one is going to want to make you stop praying. The evil one is going to tell you, you're hungry and you deserve a bologna sandwich. This prayer time is a waste of your time. Go eat something. You're hungry. Or this is so boring. The Lord's not talking to me. He's obviously mad at me because I committed that sin back when I was, you know, a, a young person and, and God won't talk to me now. Why am I bothering and wasting my time? The evil one is going to give you all of these reasons to stop and you just have to ignore them. And if you really feel tempted to stop praying, that's where you stay one minute longer just to piss the devil off. you got to give the Lord every second that you've promised him. And so do that every day. And if you get to a point where you feel you don't know what to do next, come talk to me, the other Father Dominic, Deacon Juan, Deacon Mike. We're here to help you and to walk with you in the spiritual life, to help you know that you are loved by the Father and that the Father desires a relationship with you. Daily prayer is what will move your heart to a disposition of trust and surrender. From there, you will know to always stay with the Lord, no matter what.